Today we're asking two religious women how they might use their energies to address the injustices women face within the institutional church. As respected leaders in their own right, they will offer some answers regarding how women religious can help build a new church where women and men are true partners and true equals. So join us in a conversation moderated by Deborah, excuse me, by Deborah Rose Milovic, uh, who is with Future Church in the U.S. Okay. And along with, with Sister Simone, as well. She'd been no, no, you said yeah. Yeah. As well as Sister Mary John Manazan. 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 Thank you. Manazan. Thank you. Manazan. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Can you hear me? Is my mic on? Okay, good. All right. So I just, my first question is, I don't know why my feet don't hit the floor when Sister Shalini, who's a little bit short, shorter than <laughs> I am, her seem to be touching the floor. So if my, my shoes fall off during this, don't be excited. So, <laughs> um, so I'm so happy to be here today with these two uh, very accomplished women religious leaders. Um, I just want to start off with just a little bit of context. Um, I'm just reminded this morning, as a matter of fact, that in 1971, the Synod of Bishops wrote, while the church is bound to give witness to justice, she recognizes that anyone who ventures to speak to people about justice must first be just in their eyes. Hence, we, the church, must examine ourselves. So as we come to this special Amazon Synod, I just wonder to what degree this prophetic 1971 statement is being filled. And as the Synod considers the health of our planet and the health of our church, we know that the voices of women will be critical. Yet we know that women religious will not vote. So I want to look at this question of justice within the church through the eyes of women religious and these two women religious and in a conversation with them. So I want, to know who you're, I want you to know who you're talking with today because they are amazing. And if I were on a seesaw, they, I would be up here and they'd be way down there because they're, yeah, they're, anyway. the, the weightiness of their work. But Sister Mary John Mananzen is a missionary Benedictine sister. She's a noted theologian and author. She has served as president of St. Scholastica's College as prioress of the Missionary Benedictine Sisters in the Manila Priory. She served as national chairperson of the Association of Major Religious Superiors of the Philippines. She is a political and feminist activist who helped develop an Asian feminist theology of liberation and works with a number of organizations that deal with gender issues and women's concerns. Currently, she ministers as superior of the Manila community and as a member of the Priory Council. And just note, everyone, follow along. She will be serving as a theological consultant at this synod coming up. So we're very glad that she'll be there. <laughs> Sister Simone Campbell has served as executive director of Network Lobby for Catholic Social Justice since 2004. She is a religious leader, attorney, poet, wow, with extensive experience in public policy and advocacy for systematic change. In Washington, she lobbies on issues that help mend the gaps in income and wealth in the U.S., focusing specifically on how they disproportionately affect people of color and women. <clears throat> Around the country, she is a noted speaker and educator on these public policy issues, and she is well known for her famous nun's letter, which was critically important in passing in the United States the Affordable Care Act, as well as her famous nuns on the bus tour, which Magdalene had mentioned, uh, where she draws attention to things like unjust federal budgets, the wealth gap, and the desperate needs of too many people in the United States. So I'm going to begin today with um, a couple of questions for the sister. We'll take one at a time. So as we look at the voice of women religious within the church, uh, I want to just point out that women religious have been pioneers spreading the gospel mission throughout the world. They are beloved by Catholics who recognize their work to improve the lives of women. 
their efforts to end poverty, sex trafficking, domestic abuse, all violence against women, and improving education for women and girls. You know, it's just been remarkable, and people do recognize how, how much they've done for the church, just, you know, building it out in such important ways. Yet, some also see a gap between their fierce passion for justice that women religious enact for women and children in the world and their work for women who suffer within the institutional church, the sexism that's still present within the church. For these women, the church too often ignores, the women in the church, the church too often ignores or discounts their gifts, their talents and faith when it comes to governing, governance and ministry. So the first question I pose to you is, first of all, do you even agree with that, which you're totally allowed to not agree? And if so, do you see a need for women religious to respond more fully to the needs of women within the church, the people who are not necessarily consecrated, but who are working within the church and always bumping up against those patriarchal boundaries? Um, I think that when I was in my rabid feminist phase, <laughs> when I was very angry at the patriarchal church, and I could barely live with myself, and my sisters could hardly live with me, I had a lot of anger and a lot of engagement. I finally realized the anger was devouring me. And I came to know that I was so angry because I had been an instrument of my own oppression and that made me mad. <laughs> but once I made peace and forgave myself, then I could enter into a dialogue that didn't necessarily get seen on a regular basis. I was elected to be the leader of my community, and it's a five-year term. And I got elected when my community at our chapter, at our decision-making body, our statement started with, the statement from Vatican II, we are the church. We know it, we own it, and we will act on it. And my prayer led me to realize that my job was to go to all the bishops where our sisters were and tell the story of my sisters, and then to invite them to, as Jesus did, come and see. Now I have to tell you that only one of the bishops ever came and saw, <laughs> but they every year in my pilgrimage to different dioceses, I would tell new stories. And I came to realize that my role in leadership was to be a missionary for my sisters, to make sure that their stories were known. And while that didn't get seen in the public, I think it was a critical piece of work because what I have learned is you won't break their heads, but you might be able to break their hearts. And change happens in the heart first, and then they have to follow with their head. Thank you. Sister can you Mary hear John? me? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, we can. Okay, my direct immediate answer is definitely yes. But I would like to give a historical uh, background to this because uh, before the Spaniards came to our country, we women were equal to the men. Not only that, we were the only, uh, only women could be priests only women, they are called babaylan. And these uh, women were the intermediary between the spirit world and the human world. And they were considered the most important 
persons in the village, beginning with the chief, the one that makes the sword, and the babaylan. And only women can become babaylan. If a man would like to do the ceremonies of a babaylan, he must wear the garment of a woman. How, di how different it is from today. That's why I'm so much more uh, you know, um, inspired to really see that my own women, um, our people, that we, we get back to our legacy of our equality. You know, the reason why the women before the Spaniards came were equal to the men is because our foreparents did not have a concept of virginity. Therefore, they did not overprotect the daughter. They were just considered the same as the boys. They had the same freedom of movement, all rights of inheritance, etc., etc. Now, when the Spaniards came, they were so shocked at our freedom. And so they said, oh, these women, they are too free. They cannot go to heaven. Maybe it was sincere from their part to go, make us go to heaven. So, but they cannot go like that. So we have to re-educate them. That is what I call the domestication of the indigenous yes. woman. Yeah. And how did they do that? Uh, they, first of all, educated the mother, saying to them, you know, you should take care better of your daughters because they have this crystal ball that if anything happens to this crystal ball, they will lose their dignity as if virginity and dignity are one. Mm. And of course, they, they, they actually succeeded in domesticating our women. But I always say, there is in every Filipino woman this um, memory a dangerous, subversive memory of our equality. And that is what is inspiring our women's movement in the Philippines. Yes. Because we had it, so we lost it. Now we have to have it again. So definitely, and as religious women, since we have in somehow uh, an insight into the, well, as feminist theologian, this insight into the gender um, dynamics, and I know that even if uh, we have done something, we have not reached all women in the Philippines. And for me, this is the reason why I am really much more inspired and urged to um, awaken awareness. And you know, I was so touched by all the all the the sharing. Mm -hmm. I was so touched, and excuse me, I was angry, really angry and saddened. And that's, that gives me much more inspiration to do more than what I am Absolutely. really doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, another question that I have is, um, you know, from my perspective and here in Rome, I think the International Union of Superiors General, this largest body of women religious in the world, they've really been a leading voice for women's fuller participation and for a deliberative voice in the church. And when I think of their work, I think of two moments just recently that kind of stand out for me. So in, 19, in 2016, Sister Carmen Samu asked the Pope to open this question of women deacons. And he immediately did it. He set up a commission of six women and six men, which was noteworthy in and of itself. And then this last May, at their assembly again, he gave them a report on what further work needs to happen, and people interpret it in all, all sorts of ways. And that's a report that we're eagerly awaiting from the uh, UISG. But, um, but the most iconic image from that meeting was when she, and maybe you've seen it, I hope you have, is when she is sitting next to Pope Francis at the desk at the meeting. And I just, it was so inspiring to me personally, and I think many other women and men, because it was an image, an iconic image, of what real partnership could look like. Because I think Pope Francis really does have um, a special place in his heart for Sister Carmen Samu, and I think for the UISG in general. But it made me think, what could the church be if men and women actually sat together and mapped out develop this roadmap for how to address some of our, the worst problems in the world. And then at the same meeting, I was also hurt by the same 
uh, response that Pope Francis gave to Sister Katerina Gantz. Um, you know, his, his notion of, of uh, you know, what, what the reasons for not uh, bringing the women deacon uh, diaconate forward right now, but it was his final comment that was really quite hurt, hurtful. And he said to her at the end, we are Catholics, but if anyone wants to found another church, they are free to do so. Oh, no. It was so dismissive and so painful. And I thought, I love Pope Francis. I really do love him and I love these women. And it hurt me. And I got lots of emails from other Catholic women who were hurt by this. And it's just emblematic of how a woman can sit next to somebody and be an equal at one moment, not a true equal, but a, you know, maybe an, an image of an equal sometimes within the institutional church, and I'm not talking about how women function throughout. But then there's this, these painful moments where just, it's just that easy to brush them aside. And so, um, you know, I say all that to say that Catholics do have a really deep trust in women religious. We trust them, and I, I say this as a grandmother, a mother, uh, you know, uh, you know, a woman, a wife, you know, all the things that women are in the church, we trust them because of what they do in the world. I've been totally inspired by Catholic women, religious. And in this case, at the UISG meeting, it was them talking about women deacons. Uh, and so when, when Catholics get troubled when, when someone brushes or attacks Catholic women religious, as they did in 2012 in the United States when the Vatican investigated him. So my question to you two is, can you tell me about times when you felt dismissed, maybe when you felt other women were dismissed, and especially when their voices and actions were prophetic and of great benefit to the people of God? And then also, how did you or your communities overcome these dismissals or attacks? Well, I'll start because I have one that leaps to mind when you mentioned 2012. I believe most people here know that in 2012, the Vatican issued a censure against the Leadership Conference of Women Religious in the United States. <laughs> and they named two organizations as being a bad influence on Catholic sisters. One of them was my organization, and the other was the legal office for uh, religious in the United States. The legal office for religious in the United States was quite like your experience, Shalini, that the bishops of the United States were, some of them, were angry that the legal office had defended sisters keeping their property and were upset, the bishops were upset that they had lost in court. <laughs> I'm a lawyer and so I could have told them they were gonna lose, but they didn't ask. The reason they named my organization goes back to 2010 when we were having a big debate in the United States about extending health care to more of our people. I know it's very difficult for people around the world to believe that in the United States, it is so difficult to get health care and that we don't have general access for our people. But we did this big political work. I lobby on Capitol Hill. We worked really hard. Um, and finally, there was a bill that had a chance of going through. And so the Catholic Health Association came out in favor of the bill. And I wrote a letter for Catholic sisters to sign because many Catholic sisters congregations run healthcare in the United States. So who would know better about what's best for healthcare? Catholic sisters. So I wrote a letter, like we do a lot, and got them to sign. I had 59 signers on this letter. But while it's out being signed, the uh, I wrote it on a Saturday, on, uh, sent it out on Sunday. On Monday, the bishops of the United States come out opposing the bill. Now, they came out opposing the bill because their staff 
who is very conservative and aligned with the Republican Party in our nation, gave the bishops bad information. They said there was federal money for abortion in the Affordable Care Act. Two courts in the United States have found as a matter of law, there's no question, there is no federal funding of abortion in the Affordable Care Act. And four years after it passed, the bishops finally changed their website to say they feared there was federal funding of abortion. But what happened was our letter came out after the bishops and the media became our friend because the media had sisters versus bishops. It wasn't our intention to do that. That was not my plan. All I wanted was health care for our people. But as a result of it, I know 29 votes we were able to get in the House of Representatives that allowed the bill to pass. And we now have 24 million people who have health care who would not have had it otherwise. For me, it was, uh, okay, since we're Catholic sisters here and we know the office, it was like the nunc dimittis, now, O oh Lord, dismiss your servant in peace. I had done something good in my life. And it brings, me, it brings tears to my eyes now. But as what one of the signers said was when the bishop of her diocese said that her Benedictine community could not use parish property to have their social justice meeting because she had signed the letter. Another bishop said the sisters couldn't advertise their vocation day because she had in the, in the uh, diocesan newspaper because she had signed the letter. But here is the mystery of the Holy Spirit. The mystery of the Holy Spirit is that the secular media got a hold of this. And the sisters who could not advertise in their diocesan newspaper had more women showing up for a vocation <laughs> day than they had ever experienced before. The sisters who couldn't have their um, social justice meeting on church property were offered a, a space downtown and it, became, it has become a big interfaith meeting because of it. And because of the censure is the reason we have nuns on the bus. And I feel so humbled to be used by the Spirit in this way to be able to lift up the needs of our people, to bring joy in the midst of anguish, to know that we're in solidarity and in community, I have to say, should we send the Vatican a thank you note? <laughs> the challenge is, the challenge is the anguish sometimes trips me up because it makes me so mad and so hurt. But what I have learned is Fidelity in a contemplative practice to listen to where the spirit whispers can lead us to this new creation. This is a big time of change and anguish only opens us up to be willing to suffer with and not lord it over. And so, yes, we were sent, we were, we were said that we were censured by the Vatican. They said we promoted radical feminist themes incompatible with the gospel. And I don't think they'd ever read the gospel because clearly <laughs> it's a feminist organization. So. Oh, well, I'd, I'd like to say my experience as when I was prioress, then I was a member of the Association of Major Religious Superiors of the Philippines. And we did a lot of strong statement against the corruption in the government. And we did make a statement, GMA resign. That is, the Gloria Macapagal Arroyo was the president, and we said, resign. But the CBCP, the, uh, the, uh, the bishops' conference, did not do that. So one priest told us, you are going against the bishops. And I said, no. We are not going against the bishops. We are going beyond the bishops. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's not against. It's really beyond. I said, and if they want to follow us, then thank you. But if they don't, we just go ahead. 
And then in, in the major religious superiors, we have what we call mutual relations. That means there are five of us from the major superiors and five bishops. And we could discuss issues. There are two issues I, I put there. And that is the sexual abuse of the clergy. Because it's really, there's a lot of cover up. They just transfer them to another parish and they get a virgin territory in that parish, you know. <laughs> and I, I really believe in a, in a TV show. I told them if, if a um, religious priest has a sexual relationship with an adult, okay, it might be immoral, but it's not criminal. But when this priest, there was a, a, a real uh, case, takes advantage of the 16 year old girl, it's not only immoral, it is criminal, and he belongs in jail. But I don't know of anyone who is in jail right now. And you know, when I was saying that to the bishops, and one bishop said, oh, but that is such a rare occasion. Oh my God, I almost lost my call. Of course not, bishop, it's not. And it just so happened that we had a survey, um, we, tried, we got funding for it, and there was a married old nun, Nila Bermisa, she's there now, and she wrote a book called that she may dance again. And it's really a, a survey of all the, all the sexual abuse of the priests, not of nuns, but of, of lame women. And I told them to show you that this is not a real, I really called up my office and said, I gave them each one a book, please read it, I said. So you have their documented, it's not a real case. Another case that I want, I brought it up with them, and I think we should also consider that, is the fate of local congregations. You know, there was a bishop, local, local I mean diocesan congregations, oh. not of papal right. Now there is a bishop in one of the provinces, he thought he was going to succeed the Cardinal of Cebu, so he bought a pectoral cross, which he has no right to have, you know, actually. And then he lost it. Now there is a local congregation that was serving us uh, in the household. And when he lost that, he actually accused the nun who is in charge of the household of stealing it. But he did not stop at that. He called for the National Bureau of Investigation to come and take the picture of that nun, you know, like a criminal holding this and that. And, and you know what? After some time, he found this pectoral cross in his rosaries, just a lot of rosaries, and within it is this pectoral cross. So the, the superior wrote to me, and I brought the letter to the to this bishops, and they brought it to the CBCP, and actually they asked that bishop to apologize. And I remember the superior told me that when they were having the, the dialogue, the sister told the bishop, I'm sorry, Monsignor, but when I look at your face, I see Satan, <laughs> said like that. But he was, she was so traumatized that actually she left the convent. And this is a, for me, the fate of um, the diocesan congregations, they really are like maids, not only handmaids, real maids. And economically, even if you are four sisters in a house and you are taking care of the school, you are taking care of the hospital, you are taking care of catechetical, you are taking care of everything. But what do you get as support? Okay, you have a house, but you get a financial support that is equivalent to the salary of one sister, even if you are four sisters. So I really feel that we have to be very, uh, you know, that is some, something in our church that we have to fight for the, the rights of uh, diocesan congregations. Well, I think the uh, lesson today is do not let Sister Mary John Menanzen or Sister Simone come after you because you will be in a lot of trouble. Uh, the, <laughs> Just to, just to wrap up, because, uh, and I also want to tell you all that there's a new petition out on votes for Catholic women, and we'll, we'll tell you about how to get that. But just to wrap up, so I want to circle back to this question. So as a woman who is not consecrated, I am an associate of a, a religious community, as a woman who works in a reform organization that works for the equality of women in the church, and there are, are other ones, what is the relationship to, of, of religious sister to that work? I mean, I, can, I already heard some of what you've done, but you know, help us to understand what has, maybe, maybe what more could be done. I know that there's, uh, or if you think more can be done to actually address the question of you know, how the governance of the church works. 
Uh, I know that women religious, their communities often have had quite a bit of autonomy. They've been able to move in some ways, but just to look at what women in a parish often face, uh, what more would religious sisters say or do around that question? I think that the church is in a spiritual crisis and that the leadership is holding on to rules because they don't have a clue about being a spiritual leader. And that I believe it's up to us women and our friendly men to ha practice a deep contemplative life that then acts on what we hear without fear. And the thing that I know for myself is that when I, I think the Holy Spirit lives in this part, just in my stomach, around my waist, and that when I know something from that space, it's obvious, it just needs to be done. And there's no question about it. And, oh, don't worry about it. Um, the important thing is that we act on what we hear. And if we trust that we are the body of Christ, everybody has a different part to play. And play that part to the maximum. And I joke and say, my, I've come to realize in prayer that my part in this body of Christ is to be stomach acid in the body of Christ. <laughs> Because my part is to break down food or to stir up energy. But your part, Deb, is to be engaged in creating a future church. Your job, Mary John, is doing a, as a theologian and a reflector and a bringer of your culture in such a fabulous way. Everybody has a part to play. And if we play our part in community, this will change but it's up to us to listen deeply and act on it. Thank you. So, uh, Sister, well, do you want to say I a few I think that there are two things that are necessary for change. One is a change of consciousness, and the other is change of structure. Unless these two are changed, then that nothing will be changed. Now, with regard to the change of consciousness, I think we need still to do a lot of, of consciousness raising, mm -hmm. not only among women, but among men. Actually, I have an Institute of Women's Studies, and we just, we just developed a module on gender issues for men. And we are doing this not only for, we are giving this not only to our teachers, and we are trying to, to focus on seminarians, you know, because these are going to be the priests later on who is supposed to be the, the spiritual director of women, and they will just say, oh, be patient, you know, <laughs> it's, your, it's your, your job to keep the marriage intact and all that. Now, we are going to change. We are changing that kind of mentality because the priests, the men, they are the perpetrators. So how come we are not educating them and we are just educating the women? I would say I need to do more of that, yeah. you know, okay. reach more, especially seminarians, those who are going to become a priest. Amen. Well, I can't tell you what a joy it's been to talk with you both. I do want to let everybody know that of course, Voices of Faith has, this, has a campaign, Overcoming Silence. There are many pieces coming out about that. We will be launching a new petition uh, on the Votes for Catholic Women. Please sign it. It'll, we'll make sure that it's on the Voices of Faith site. It'll be on Future Church's site, Women Ordination Conference site. So please make sure you sign that. And then watch and join in. Uh, I've got a white scarf on today because of the Maria 2.0 movement that's happened in Germany where women have decided to strike, uh, you know, saying enough is enough. There are many ways to, as I love Kate McElwee's uh, little saying, to engage in the ministry of irritation. So let's do that together. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you.